Welcome. Everyone is all so eager. I love the beginning of the year. It's all fresh and new and everyone's so like, yeah, I can do this. I'm going to kick some AUE bum. So just to give you a little bit of introduction, my name is Melissa. I'm a CA and also a CFA level three candidate. Yay. Um, I've been lecturing this my fifth year now and this is what I love to do. Love to be here and help shape young minds. You know, no, I'm joking. Um, so you'll notice throughout the year I'm a little uh, weird, but you know, it's okay because if you lose the weird in you, you lose the fun in you. So you'll probably laugh at me a lot, but that's okay. I, I can take it. So I like AUE because it's like we get an A for AUE, right? That's that's the goal, right? AUE. Mm? So. You have collected a pack, so I'm going to give you a little bit of an intro and what we're going to cover. So you're getting a, you got like a little notes pack, so it's got slides and some notes in between and some pictures that I thought were relevant. Then you also, when you register, you're also going to get a question pack and a solution pack. So what I do is I go through <clears throat> both the tight letters for level one and two and for those of you that are doing level one versus level two and wondering, you know, the difference, I'm not talking for other subjects, I'm talking for AUE, there is not much of a difference at all. Okay, so what you'll find is if you go through the two tight letters together, like 90% of it's the same, the same questions, the same everything. Okay, so I do the classes together because the content is the same and often what they do is you'll see that they'll have like a test for last year, for example, for level one, they'll put it into this year for level two and vice versa. So they constantly swap it around. It's not like level two is harder all the time and level one's like so easy. It's not like that at all. Sometimes level one is harder. Okay, so for AUE, there really is not much of a difference. So like I said, I do not speak for other subjects, okay, only for AUE. I do them together because for all intents and purposes, they're the same on all material respects. Yeah? So you're going to get then a question pack and a solution pack for those of you that continue on and register and come to the TUTs. So now what I do is I go through all the TUT letters and I go through all the questions that are in there, the examples, the questions, everything. And I make sure from both TUT letters that we cover all the questions you need from your TUT. Literally, I cover all of them. And you'll see that we, we go through, I think for the first test, I think we go through like eight, nine or ten questions, I can't remember exactly now. And that covers all the questions from both types. So whether you're level one or two, I'm covering everything you need for the test, okay? So yes, you're going to cover a few extra ones, but that's okay. Okay, it's not going to hurt you, okay? But like I said, if you compare tight letters side by side, they're like 90% the same, okay? So that's for those of you that are wondering about that. So <clears throat> for those of you that did level one last year or did this before, and um, they did decide to swap level, ugh, level, test one and two. <clears throat> so test two was previously the uh, um, legislation, the King, the Companies Act, the Code, and the CPC. Now that's test one, okay. Which is not terrible, actually, because there's a lot of content to go through in this, uh, in this, mo in this test material, right? And you actually have more time in test one than you do in test two. So it's actually not such a bad thing. And also some of the stuff in test that used to be in test one that's now in test two, you actually need the CPC for anyway. So it's actually better that we go through this first. I think it's a good thing. Okay. So we have more time to go through the big voluminous stuff or the content or the theory sort of legislation-y stuff. And then we can start going through the auditing standards after that. Okay. So that's what we're going to go through. So now just to show you from an admin perspective how it works. So when you register, you get invited to a, <clears throat> a classroom. It looks like that. Okay. So when you open it, it looks like that. So you'll have one for AUE and then you'll have another one for FAC and another one for MAC and another one for tax. Okay. So it's just a little welcome message and it's almost like a, I like to call it like a little Facebook group. You know, you post stuff and only people in the group can see and you can comment and ask questions and whatever. So that's what it sort of works, how it sort of works. And then if you go to the, so that's the stream section. And then if you go to the about section, it's where you're going to get all your material. Okay, come on. So the only thing you're going to see in here is something called an all-in-one pacer. Okay, so it's, a, it's almost like an Excel spreadsheet. It's called a Google sheet, but it's kind of like Excel. Okay, so you click on it and it looks like that. Okay, so it's pretty much got your week, your date, your times over there and then you'll see so saturday 27 jan you'll see you've got a lecture 
AUE, right? So AUE you'll see is all green and then tax is blue and then et cetera, et cetera. So you'll see every day we've planned what you need to do, when you need to do homework, what, which questions you need to do. And if you want to go specifically to AUE, you say, okay, well, what did I do in AUE? You're going to click, it says link to AUE, so it's not so, so confusing. And you're going to click that link and you're going to get a separate little AUE one that looks like that. Okay, and that's exactly what we're going to cover and then it gives you AUE homework and what I'm going to do throughout the semester, oh, throughout the year, I'm going to update these and put videos on, okay, and link the videos. So if you want to go over something again, if you miss something, you can always catch up and watch the video. So you'll see these become underlined as we go through the year. And when they become underlined, they've got a video attached to them. Okay. Yeah, so 13 March. At least it's not 14 Feb, right? We can be grateful, right? Okay. Okay, so that's sort of, and then if you want to go back, you click all in one pacer and then it takes you back so you can see where you're at. And then you want to go tax, you click on the tax link and it'll, you'll have a little one that's got a little tax breakdown. Everyone understand the admin there? Happy? Excited? Yay. Okay, so going to go through, so they've put fraud and laws and regulations in here, which isn't such a terrible thing because I like to think of it now as like, you know, you link it in with especially those new no-clock provisions as well as the Audits and Profession Act. So we do the two ISAs and then the rest of the legislation. Okay. Any questions? All right. So the rest of this uh, uh, this slide is just uh, telling you exactly what we're going to cover, but I, I feel like we're going to go through it now, so we don't necessarily need to do that. But if you want to, you can see a little breakdown of each little section, okay, so of all these little listed ones that I've got here. Um, just one more thing I want to mention as we go along. Um, I uh, We go through, the, let's call it the theory, right? So we go through the content and everything. But what I like to do is I like to say, okay, well, what type of question can we get based on this content? So it doesn't help just learning the theory and not knowing, well, what am I going to use it for? How can I practically apply this information? Okay, that's completely useless. Okay, so you can't just learn because you don't know what you're learning for, how you're going to learn it. So we go through it, and then as we go through, we talk about what types of questions you can get on this. And not only that, but how to answer those types of questions. Okay, and you're not only going to hear this from me, you're going to hear it from everyone, like basically in every class all about exam technique, okay? It's not what you know. It's not what you said, but how you said it. It's always like that. Now, when we go through what types of questions you can get for each of these little sections, we're going to talk about how you need to present it, how you need to say it. I'm going to teach you the auditing a language. Because if you want to pass, you need to talk a audit. Okay? If you don't talk in my language, you don't talk in my marks. So, so that's the sort of way I do it. So I go through it and then I go through a little summary mind map my Bob and I talk about the technique and what we need to make sure we include in our writing and how we need to structure it and how we need to write our sentences. Okay? And then as we go along, I'll also mention things to flag and stuff, especially for this test, okay? I'm going to, especially when we get to something like the Companies Act, I'm going to make a flagging list, okay? And then we're gonna, you're going to write that down, and then you're going to know which items to flag, which are the most important ones that come up, and what needs to be talked about together, and group them, and stuff like that. Okay. Woo. Fraud. <laughs> Very exciting start. Anyone hear about Steinoff? Exciting, hey, it's so cool. You'd think like in this day and age, like with the amount of laws and standards that we've got, this couldn't happen anymore, but yet it still happens. Like I don't understand how people slip through the cracks anymore. Like it just doesn't make sense to me. Like with all the stuff that we have, how can, where? Like it just doesn't make sense to me, but it's exciting nonetheless. Okay, fraud. So we're gonna look at Background, what is the purpose of the auditor and what is not the purpose of the auditor? And if I trip here, you can laugh, but then maybe come help me because there's a thing here. Um, and what the rest of the standard looks like, so the characteristics and things we need to look out for. And then 
Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention, when we go through these uh, different sections, the sizes, the companies that do everything, it's great to know them all separately, but then we also need to integrate them. So at the end, I'm going to go through an integration of exam technique for all of them together. And how we, and because very common um, type of question is asking them all in one question for like 40 marks. Okay, that's like pretty much a test, one required, boom, go. Okay, not always, but that's very common. So you need to know how to, you know, structure when they all integrate it together. Okay. Cool. Yay. Okay, so the background. We're talking ISA 240. Okay, it's quite a fat little ISA. <laughs> fat little. Fat big ISA. Um, how does fraud fit into the grander scheme of things? So in terms of questions you can get asked, it's normally linked in with other things. So what you'll notice is when we go through the RI definition, for those of you that hopefully remember, um, one of those elements is fraud. When they ask you risks at overall financial statement level, which is actually now test two stuff, yeah, they could ask you risks related to fraud, fraud risk indicators, fraud risks, okay? So it's part, generally, the standard, it falls within the grander scheme of things. It's in the ISA 200s, 240, so it's in the planning phase, okay? So the ISA 200s and 300s are like the planning, okay? The 500s, 600s is execution, and 700s onwards is finalization and reporting. That's sort of kind of how they structured it. So this is part of the planning, part of the risk assessment in the planning phase. Okay. Is it the auditor's job to find fraud? I wish it was, but no, it's not. Although you do find it, and it's really fun when you do. I actually did find one once. It was so exciting. But then I was like way out of my depth. I was a second year trainee. Very scary. I'll tell you about it later. And the difference between fraud and error. What is the difference? A little picture there is telling you it. The difference is intent. Okay. Did you mean to do it? Or did you by accident do it? That is the main difference between fraud and error. Intent. Okay. What is the objective of the auditor? So it's not our job to find fraud. So then what is our job? Well, we need to identify and assess risk. So we can't just ignore it. We can't be like, oh, it's not my problem. I need to say, okay, well, are there any risks that there could be fraud? And if so, I need to deal with it. I need to respond to them through my audit strategy and my audit plan, through my overall responses and my substantive procedures and controls. Okay, my audit plan. Cool. What are the requirements? Professional skepticism. What is skepticism? I like to call it the big Q. The big questioning mind, okay? Um, would you believe me if I told you this cost a thousand rand? Why not? Because it doesn't seem right, does it? You'd be like, that's a bit weird. What is there, diamonds in here? I don't know. It'd probably be way more if there were diamonds in there. But you don't just say like, oh, I'm sure it's fine. Oh, I'm sure it's fine. You need to make sure you question everything. If it's not, if it seems even a little bit possibly out of the ordinary, why? Why? I'm not saying it couldn't cost a thousand. Maybe some famous person signed it and it is worth a thousand rand. It very well might be. But you need to get evidence to prove that. You can't just assume it's right because people are going to say, well, everyone knows those bottles cost like what? Ten rand or whatever. And you're saying a thousand rand is fine. I don't think so. The big Q. Always, throughout the audit. Discussion amongst the team, keeping everyone aware of what's going on. So if you find something, make sure everyone is aware, keep their eyes open. So when you have a big Q, let everyone in your team know. So if something is related to that, they find something similar, they're also going to have big Qs attached to their little heads. <clears throat> Fraud risk, we spoke about inquiry. Now, you're probably wondering, like, it's such a silly thing, like, inquiring of someone if there's fraud. Like, they obviously, I mean, we just spoke about intent. And if someone intended to commit fraud, they're obviously going to lie and say, no, there's no fraud. But what's interesting is, is that you'll find when we get to the required procedures to be performed, inquiry is one of them, even though it's, let's call it the not the most reliable form of evidence. Why do we have to inquire? Well, because, believe it or not, people sometimes think the audit is like the, the, the priest in that confession thing, where people just seem to confess stuff. And things do come up. When you ask people something, they think it's almost like an anonymous, like someone there to help you, like an independent party coming to like, they do come forward, believe it or not. Not always, but they do. So inquiry has to happen. 
So if they're good at lying, they better lie to your face and they better make it a good lie. Okay. Cool. Fraud risks are normally seen as significant risks. Significant, let's say a synonym for significant is material, right? And remember, materiality is not only quantitative, it is qualitative. And fraud is qualitatively material, isn't it? Okay. So whether you steal 100 rand or 100 million rand, you stole. It's not the point. How much it was, the point is you stole. It's qualitatively material. So most of the time, it will be a significant risk. Unless it was like some like really like silly thing, like someone stole some tea bags, I don't know, from the kitchen. Then you're like really like, cheers, you know? We don't have to like report you and stuff. Okay. Now... <clears throat> Remember I told you fraud can come through in the risk question. Now, I'm not sure how they're going to structure if they're going to ask you risks now, but I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit later. But if they do ask you for risks and they ever ask you for assertion level risks for revenue, which is a very common one, you always have one present. So it's actually really cool if they ask it of you because you're already getting one mark. As long as you remember that whenever there's revenue, risks, you know that there's always a presumed fraud risk in revenue recognition linked to which assertion? Oi, do you remember your assertion? <laughs> occurrence, occurrence, oh, 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 there's fraud, oh, 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 occurrence, okay, ha, <laughs> oh, oh. There's also a risk of management override of control, that's one of the inherent limitations of internal control, isn't it? that management can abuse their responsibility, override their risk, collude, um, or circumvent controls. So what you'll find is no matter which audit you do, you will always test revenue, rec fraud, re uh, occurrence, you'll test credit notes and things around your end, and you'll always test all entries at your end. Why? Because of the risk of override. Why? Because you have to, because the standard says so. <laughs> you don't have a choice. So that's what you're going to do for every single audit you do, because you have to. How do we respond? So now we said, okay, well, we said we need to identify the risks, and we mentioned some of the, you know, some of the presumed risks, and we'll go through more risk indicators just now. So now what do we do? So we find the risk. Okay, well, noted. Is that it? Like, we find a risk, and then what? Like, what do we do then? We deal with it, right? We've got to respond to it. Now, a fraud risk can either be at overall level or assertion level. If you're talking at, at an overall level, if you're talking about someone that is involved in many areas, like some fraud at like a high level, like some FD or something, that affects many accounts, many assertions, you're going to need to have more overall responses. Now, it's very difficult from an overall perspective to have a very specific thing to deal with fraud because there are so many areas that they could have fudged something, okay? So what are some examples of responses? These are in your center. I'll tell you where you can flag them now. Assigning more experienced staff. So remember we spoke about the big Q. The older we get, the bigger Qs we get. It's like, we, it's like our growing head, the bigger we get. You know, it's like a big Q. We need to keep more experienced people because they're more questioning. They've got more experience, know what's reasonable for a bottle of water and what's not. As we get older, we get more experience. Evaluate the accounting policies. Are they consistent? Are they reasonable? Or are you always choosing the policy that makes your profit look higher so you can get a bigger bonus? Unpredictability. So for those of you that uh, audit those entities and they're like, yeah, we did those procedures last year, let's just do them again this year. Technically, if there's a fraud risk, you need to change it up a little bit. Why? Because if you always test the same stuff, management's not stupid. <laughs> they're going to know where they can hide stuff because they're going to know where you look and where you don't look. Assertion level responses going to be much more specific, like the one that we said for revenue, okay? We're going to need a lot more reliable evidence, okay? Testing journal entries, I told you, at your end, that's going to have to be done to assess, to address the management override of controls risk. And then accounting estimates. We're going to do a lot more of these, go into a lot more of detail with these things when we get to test three, when we talk about substantive procedures and how to audit these, okay? Evaluate business rationale, again, coming through with related parties. Why are they entering into certain transactions? Why is it more complicated than it actually needs to be? 
And then we need to evaluate audit evidence. Now, there's specific procedures we can do, like I said, and a lot of the stuff we're going to deal with in test three, but just as like an overview, because it's in the standard, we need to always keep in mind that fraud could happen. So even though you've audited this client for the last 20 years and there's never, ever been any issue, by the way, if there's never, ever, ever any issue, that's also really dodgy. Okay, no one's ever that clean. Okay. Um, that's also a risk, believe it or not. But if even if you've known someone for like foot sack years and they've always done it right, you can't just assume that there's no fault. You still have to keep on the lookout because that's you never know when the flip, when the switch has flipped. Interestingly, when we talk about substantive procedures, I don't know if any of you guys remember any of this stuff from undergrad or last year or whatever. We had two types of substantive procedures. We got test of detail and analytical procedures. Yeah, sort of ringing a bell. Now, interestingly, test of detail lets you know, provides a lot more evidence, right? Because it's detailed testing. We're getting evidence over specific things, and we're getting a lot more reliable evidence. Whereas analytical procedures are more like trends, reasonableness tests, making sure things are in line with what we expect. So you're probably thinking, like, for fraud, you know, we're going to do a lot more tests of detail because we want more evidence because there's more risk, right? And and the and the logic is right, but what they're saying is analytical procedures have another special power. They have a special power because they can identify things that are out of the ordinary, like a bottle for a thousand rand. Because when you're analyzing trends, you expect to follow a certain movement. And as soon as you see a spike up, spike down, whatever the case may be, you can be like, okay, well, what happened there? Why did that happen? Okay. Why, why did it go down there? Why did, why did that bottle go up there? So they can actually help you to identify these things. Okay. So that's actually quite cool. You need to get a written representation specifically for fraud. Okay. So one of your direct responses is get a representation from management. So you know how we said we need to inquire from them? We also need to get a representation from them so that they have it in, we have it in writing as documented evidence that there is no fraud or they're not aware of any fraud. And communications. And we're going to talk about the communications now when we get to the Code of Professional Conduct and the Auditing Profession Act. Who we need to communicate if we do find fraud. What, what then? Okay. And then documentation. You guys have heard the rule in your, in your audit firms. If it's not documented, it's not done. Same yeah. That's why. Why? Because the standards say so. If you don't document it, it's not there. Do you think SARS is going to grant you an allowance if you don't have proof for that expense? <laughs> no. Please. Dream on. Same thing. If someone says to you, how do you know that this is, uh, you know, the value of this is 100 rand? Well, there's the proof. There's my documented evidence. Not like, oh, somewhere up here. Well, this could be long gone by now. You know? Document. Alas. I don't speak Afrikaans, but there's a few words I really like. Okay, fraud, we talk about the fraud triangle. Why? A triangle has three sides, three points as well, I suppose. And there's three things that need to be present in order for you to prove fraud. And you probably think, geez, that's quite a lot of things to need to prove, but it's not that difficult. Same thing, if you want to prove someone is guilty of a murder, you've got to have some proof, don't you? Number one, you need an incentive. What reason did you have? What motive did you have to do this? And what you'll find is most of your risks are incentives. Oh, I could have, I could get a promotion if, I could get a better bonus if, I might not get fired if. Okay, it's all an incentive, a reason to manipulate. Most of them will be incentives. The other one is an opportunity. You have to be able to have actually done it. It has to have been possible for you to do it. If there are like 77 different locks on the safe, I don't know, and I don't even have one, how, you, how did I get in there? How, how, how would I possibly have gotten in there? It's impossible. How would I have robbed a bank in Switzerland today? I'm not there, okay? I didn't, I, you, I have an alibi, let's say. Okay. When we talk about it in the auditing context, we're talking about controls, okay? The controls, if they're really good, the opportunities are a lot less, but if the controls are weak, there is a lot more opportunity for fraud to happen. And the last one is the attitude or rationalization. Okay, well, everyone's doing it, so why can't I? Well, because it's wrong, <laughs> that's why. 
Now, what you'll find is if they do ask you to talk about fraud and fraud risk factors, what they what we might need to do is break it up into these three headings. But I'll summarize this for you once we've gone through this. I'll show you. Okay, so incentive, opportunity, and attitude. Okay, two types of fraud. Fraudulent financial reporting, first type. Okay, that is, let's call it, what do they say? Cooking the books. Fraudulent journal entries, fraudulent, so things in the accounting records that are not there or not supposed to be there. And the second one is misappropriation of assets. Now, most of the time, misappropriation will also come with fraudulent financial reporting because you're going to have to hide your frauds or your theft somehow, won't you? Because misappropriation of assets is actually stealing money, stealing assets, using assets for personal use. If you do that, you're going to have to make sure the accounting records don't show your little indiscretion. Okay. So normally fraudulent financial reporting is present, and that's the main one that we, I suppose, look at. Look, I'm not saying we don't look at this. I'm saying fraudulent financial reporting is also in here as well. So Now... In your books, in ISA 240, the main things that I would suggest you flag is the appendices. Okay. In each appendix, you've got a nice list of things that will help you to answer questions. So the first appendix is fraud risk factors. And what it's done in appendix one is it said, okay, incentives, remember we had the three, the fraud triangle, and then we had the two types, right? Fraudulent financial reporting and misappropriation of assets. Yes? We spoke about it now. It actually breaks it up, all the indicators that you are looking for. So, for example, incentives, fraudulent financial reporting. Bigger bonuses, not getting fired, you know, we're not a going concern, we need to get money from the bank. Okay, there's various reasons included in the, in the, in the standard for you. So, flag it. It's really helpful. So, if you're answering a fraud question, the appendix... Uh, Appendix is going to be the most useful in that regard. Opportunities for fraudulent financial reporting. Attitudes for fraudulent financial reporting. And then the same for misappropriation. Incentive, opportunity, attitude. I've given you some examples here, but it's in your book. So flag it. In Appendix 2, so that was Appendix 1. So in Appendix 1, we've got the risk indicators. In Appendix 2... If they say to you, give me the risks of fraud, and they say also, in part B of the table, or draw a table, respond to those risks. Okay, remember what we said, the big Q, specific procedures that we need to do. Lucky for you, it's all in Appendix 2. Okay, general responses, so if they ask you for overall, like a little short little, like a five marker, and say, okay, well, just give me some responses quickly for fraud. Here's a nice list of them. Again, it's in your book. And then if they ask you responses for each one specifically, then you've got responses for fraudulent financial reporting, the revenue one that we spoke about. You'll find that the credit note testing is quite in there. And then um, inventory. How, how, would people, how would people commit fraud with inventory? Steal. Say it's there when it isn't. Like, look at that, you know, a big stack of boxes over there, you know, on that wall. They're all full, but actually they're not. There was that one I, re I researched, there was this one that did, um, they had oil in these big tanks, right? So I actually, I actually, in my article days, did a stock count of these massive oil things, and they are hectic, like, far away, they're like in Sasselberg, and you've got to, like, climb up on this thing in the dead of winter, because the year ends June, obviously, yay. In the dead of winter, you've got to climb up this thing at like the crack of, you know, a sparrow's fart to try and like dip a stick. It's literally a dipstick that you stick down this thing to see how far it is so you can measure the, you know, the volume of where this thing ends. Yo. Not cool. So what I read in terms of fraud, so something in the, with that specific example, what they did was they actually put like a, if you think about the big, um, the big like, barrel tube thing, massive thing that you're going to climb up. They actually put a thin tube in the middle with the oil, and which is what you dip, so you could see that it was oil, and the rest was like seawater or something. Cool, eh? It's, I'm just saying, it's interesting how people come up with this crap. 
So they said, yeah, no, the whole thing's full of oil, but actually it wasn't. It was just that they, they, where you dipped it in that, in that like, center point, there was a thin tube where it had oil in. Hectic, eh? I just thought that was so cool because it was so relevant to what we were doing, you know, on my stock count at the time. It was so cool. But it can happen. Okay, so again, the big Q. Let me just, can you open that side? I just want to see that there's also, I don't know. Or are you sure those boxes are full? Let me just, you know, something in there. You know, I don't know. Let me just open like a random, a couple of them. Just see that one, that one, and that one. Let me just see, you know, what's all up in there. Okay, stock counts is important for fraud as well. Management estimates. Estimates. We for other estimates. Estimates are one of those things that it's very easy to be fraudulent about. Very easy. Why? Because there's not an invoice that tells you the exact amount it's going to be, and there's not a contract, and there's not an exact calculation to tell you what it's going to be. It's um, maybe this, because you know, in my experience, it actually should be this, but not this, but higher there and lower there. And very difficult. Okay. So. Like I said, in test three, we're going to talk about how to audit those in detail because they will ask you those. They always come up every time. Flag for future reference in your mind. And then responses for misappropriation as well, like theft. Okay, and also it's not just theft of physical assets. Hey? It's also like embezzling debtors' money that they are paying the company. Okay. Okay, so you've got appendix one. You've got your indicators, right? Appendix two, you've got responses. So... If you get a question like that, you've got at least a guide to help you to answer that type of thing. They don't commonly ask fraud like by itself in a question. I haven't seen it very often. I think like two years ago, they asked um, a risk question where they asked you to split the fraud and the error risks, which is not that, it's not really specifically to fraud, it's a risk question. And then every now and then they throw it in with like an RI, but I will talk about that when we get to RIs just now. But I've hardly ever seen it as a separate big question. But should you get it, it's very likely going to be risk and response type of thing as a separate thing. And then you've got circumstances again, more circumstances that can indicate fraud in Appendix 3. So you've got three appendices. And then you've got exam further examples of things in there. Okay. So let us... Whoa, that was like, does she really speak that fast all the time? Yeah, she does. She's got a lot to say. Okay, so let's just woo, take a breath. Let's just let it settle for a second. And let's just summarize what we've just done and make sure we know what we need to do. The first thing we want to do is hmm, let's draw a table. So let's say indicators. <clears throat> with risks and responses okay for our information if we need to we're gonna uh, come on pin we're gonna just say appendix one and three there and appendix two just for reference purposes so you have a little summary sheet okay Common type of question, give me the risks and responses. Okay, so in order for us to be able to answer that question, we have to touch on some risk technique because they, Unit is very huh, not loved for a certain thing. They'll tell you this is what's in test two, but they'll actually ask you something from another test. It's quite nasty. Okay, and, and you know what? They, they're not wrong. They actually say in the tight letters, believe it or not, they say, Please note that just because this is not necessarily part of this, it doesn't mean we can't ask it. It's nasty. So I'm trying to, wherever possible, find the link between other tests and also just touch on that as well so that should they throw something like that in there, you know what to do. So you're not like, whoa, that's not cool. We haven't even done that yet. Okay. So in order for us to do this first part of the table, we need to know a little bit of our risk technique. Okay. So let's touch on that now. Okay, so risks. I'm going to go through it in detail for our next test, but for now, let's just break it down. We've got, we assess risk at two levels, overall or financial statement level and assertion level. And in the same way, when I'm linking this to fraud, 
they can ask you for fraud in both as well. Okay, obviously we're focusing on fraud here because this is the link to what we what is actually in this test. Now, what is the difference between the two? Easier to start off with the assertion level. An assertion level risk, I can link to a specific account like revenue, inventory, debtors, creditors, cost of sale. And I can link it to a specific assertion. It doesn't have to be one assertion, but one account. So I can say it affects the current and accuracy of revenue. If I mention an account, it is assertion level. Why? Because it's specific to that line item. Overall, guys, is not specific. It affects many accounts and many assertions. So if they ask you for overall risk, don't ever, ever mention something like inventory revenue. Why? Because that's assertion level. Okay? Didn't ask you for that. Asked you for overall. Mentioning something like profit is okay. Why? Because profit is many accounts, isn't it? Assets is many accounts. Liabilities is many accounts. It's not one. Okay. So know the split. Okay, answer the question. They are very strict at marking, even more so for the test than they are for the exam, believe it or not. They are very strict. Be careful. So when we talk about, now we need to split the technique because the technique is slightly different. Okay, so for overall risks, we need to mention, we need to write a couple of, oh, wait, 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 wait. come on. The system's like, come on, it's Monday, but it's not actually. There's two things we need to write for each risk. For each risk that you write, you need to write two elements. The first element is an indicator. The second element is the risk. Where do you get your indicators from? Appendix one and three. Okay. Give me some examples of indicators. Big drops or spikes in analytical reviews. What else? Foreign currencies are being used. Oh, that's hard. Risk. Although that could be more error, so just careful. Listed on JC and Forex, I'm going to say those are more for error. Although, for the JC one, there's two. There's one for error and there's one for fraud. You could say because we're listed, we want to manipulate to make our share price look better, to attract more investors, to get better dividends. So you could, fine. Come on, people. What would make you want to lie? Yes. Like what? Well, I'm using the company vehicle anyway. They're not going to know I'm going to take my whole family to Durban in that car. What is? Yeah. What else? Bonuses based on profits. You're going to get fired if you don't make sure your revenue increases by 10%. Whoa. Uh-oh. Whoops. Again, those indicators are in your book. So they're not going to be like in a list for you in your questions, right? They're going to be embedded within paragraphs of information. And that's what the tuts are for, right? Us is going through these paragraphs and paragraphs of information and interpreting what that actually means. And be like, oh, that's that indicator there, and that's what it looks like, and that's how they normally write this thing. That's the purpose of doing questions with it, because it doesn't help knowing the theory when you don't know practically how it's going to look. If you go through a couple of questions, eventually you get the hang of it and you can always see it. It's there. It's, it's like reading between the lines. You can, it's there. You just need to be able to decipher the language. Yeah? That's the point of the tuts more. Okay, so the indicator, we get through the standard. So you literally write an indicator. Bonuses are based on profits. Company car used for personal reasons. That's just the one part of it, okay? And I'm still, guys, dealing with this first part of the table here, hey? Now, <clears throat> so now I say bonuses are based on profit. That's just a statement. That's not a risk. Now, the risk, so the, there's no Let's call it specific technique for this. It's simply just a statement. Now, for the risk, there is technique. And you need to make sure you do it right. <clears throat> I break it up into three, but it's actually four. I've come to realize because people uh, 
broke my three and had to, had to make it a four. The first part is, if I'm asking you what is the risk, please tell me what the risk is. Now, what a lot of people get confused about is the risk, sorry, the difference between alt risks and business risks. Do you guys know what the difference is? Well, we all know what the purpose of a business is, right? To make money, hey? So if anything, any, if we lose money, business risk, sure. What is then an audit risk? Well, in order to answer that question, what is the purpose of an audit? Opinion, to provide an opinion. On what? Apps. In order for me to make this risk an audit risk, I have to link it to the apps. Otherwise, if I can't, it's a business risk. Do you understand? I'm not saying that an audit risk is not also a business risk, but I'm saying if you want to make it an audit risk and not a business risk, it has to be linked to the apps. Okay. Why? Because we as auditors don't really care too much about anything else except for the apps. Yes, there's a lot of integration, but you have to link it to the apps. Sometimes it's not going to be quite so clear. So the guy uses his car for personal use. So how is that going to affect the apps? Well, you need to link it for me. You need to show me how it's linked. to. Why as an auditor do I care? As a businessman, sure, I care because you're stealing my stuff. Why as an auditor? You have to link it to the apps. So that's the second part of that sentence. Link. The risk is that the apps could be misstated because. Now, the first time you write that, you, can, you have to write it full annual financial statements. And then straight after that, in brackets, you can write AFS. And then going forward, you can write apps. Why? Why do we have to write it the first time? Think about any professional writing that you've ever seen. You always have to see it the first time in full. And then in brackets, straight after, you see a little uh, abbreviation. Because then you know, oh, that's what that means going forward. You can't do that for whatever you like. Okay? You can't say, well, MM is materially misstated. No. Why? Because that's not a commonly used acronym. So you can do this sure properly for commonly used acronyms like afs the only requirement is the first time you write it in full with the little bracket afs and then going forward you can write afs why because it's a commonly used one you with me remember we're writing professional exams here okay then you have to give me the reason now the reason i've now learned that i need to break it up into two parts because of students so two parts now Interestingly enough, a part of that reason is the indicator. Now, let's, let's do, for example, that profit one. The risk is that the financials could be misstated. Reason, because bonuses are based on profits. Can you see that that part of that reason is the indicator? I've just said that that was the indicator, isn't it? That's not enough. I need like a, sorry, you just told me that. So what is the risk? Well, because the bonuses are based on profits, they may overstate incomes and understate expenses. Again, it's not an assertion because it's many. Yeah. To earn bigger profits. Do you see that there's like that second part? So it's not enough to just say because the entity is listed. You just told me that. That's, that's, that you're not giving me reasons. So what if they listed? So what if I'm wearing a black dress? Does that mean what? what who cares you have to give the reason you can't yes the indicator is part of that reason but it's not enough there is a risk that the financials could be misstated because the entity is listed comma they may manipulate the results in order to get a better share price Can you see you need that second reason part the indicator is part of it but it's not enough okay you're giving me a lovely meal, but you're not giving me cutlery to eat it with. So that just sucks. Okay. So it's actually two parts in that reason. So if you want to write a proper risk, that's what it looks like. Talk more about risks in the next test. But if they do ask you, that is how you write it. For an assertion level risk, it's a little bit more straightforward. Again, the risk is. Why? Because I'm asking you what is the risk. So tell me what the risk is. Yeah? Then you have the reason, and again, guys, the reason could be part of the indicator and part of the, again, another reason. The third part there, though, is the assertion. 
Now, you're probably wondering, why do I need to give an assertion if I asked you for assertion level risks? Well, because I asked you to tell me which assertions are at risk. If you don't tell me which assertions are at risk, then you haven't answered the question. Can you see that? Okay. So if they do ask you that, then at least you've got a little bit of background as to how to structure that if it does come up. Cool. So essentially, indicators with the risks on this side. With me? That's what we just did. Happy? Responses. Now, responses are... Hmm. Responses, let's call it, can either be general responses that can sort of applicable all over, or they can be very specific to that specific risk that you're talking about. And it's tough because you don't know necessarily which one to include when. Although you do know, because I'm going to tell you how you know. Um, those overall responses, those general responses that I spoke about in appendix to those first ones, is the econ fine, people? Everyone seems to be like, it's like Superman or something? No. There's two ways they can ask you for the responses. If they ask it of you in a table, think about what a table is, guys. There's a risk. I want a response specifically related to that one. Then I'll get another one, and then I want a response specifically related to that one, surely. Yeah? If I ask it of you in a table, you need to be specific. You can't just be like, in general, yeah, professional skepticism, done. No. You need to have a specific response for every risk that you found. Please understand that in your 40 marks and later on in your 100 mark exam, you will not get repeat marks. So if you write maintain professional skepticism more than once, if you write it 50 times, you're only going to get one mark. So what does that mean? It means that I'm going to need to be very specific in this table. However, there are certain responses that are kind of like general, that kind of go all the time everywhere. For example, the professional skepticism. Am I going to write it in each and every time? No. Why? Because I'm going to get one mark regardless, and I don't have time to write it 50 times. So what am I going to do? In my table, you have a choice. You can either, the first row of the table, you leave this part blank, and you say responses applicable to all risks. And these are all your general ones. And you literally list them, boom, 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 once. And then you start with your first risk and your first response. And now, obviously, this response, I'm not going to repeat myself. I'm going to write the specific one. And then I'm going to have risk two, indicator and risk, and response number two. And what you'll find is if you go through eventually the solutions, you'll see this is always there. It's either at the beginning of the table the or it's like at the end. It doesn't matter. But please, write it once. Don't waste your time and write it every time. I suggest you do it first because you get a, like a whole bunch of marks right up front. And then you go. Specific, specific, specific. Okay. Happy? So, where was I? So that is our risk. So essentially, if we summarize the rest of fraud, we've got our fraud triangle. Do you guys remember what the three elements were to prove fraud? Incentive, opportunity, and attitude. Yay. Hey, they're all vowels. I never noticed that until now. A -E -R, no, there's no E. Damn it. We can't make a song. I'll try for the next one. Though that's the, essentially the theory behind it, and that's how we structure it. If they so now how is, does this fit into our technique, you're probably wondering. They might ask you this type of thing, for example, and they might say, for the following. They, so it's question one, part A, B, and C. So what then? Then you might need to split your incentives. Then the next couple of risks will be your opportunities. And the next couple will be your attitudes. So that might happen. But that's not so bad, hey, because in the standard, they've actually split it up for you, haven't they? So it's not, it's not bad. 
So if they do ask it of you, if they mention it specifically, I would split it. In, unless it's specifically mentioned, I wouldn't split it. Okay? And the same goes for fraudulent financial reporting and misappropriation. Again, I can say oh, another color, purple. Incentives for fraudulent financial reporting and then the next one for misappropriation. Then opportunities for fraudulent financial reporting and, oops, misappropriation. Can you see what I'm doing? I'm splitting it up. I'm showing you how our technique filters in with the theory that we've learned. Well, the theory filters in with a technique, rather. So that's how that part of the theory fits in. This is the three elements, and then you've got your fraudulent financial reporting and your misappropriation. They fit in is simply to split up the risks that you've found and the responses to them. And that's fraud. Questions? <laughs> 